and let somebody in. Okay, um, since it's 12 o'clock, I'm just gonna start. I'll let people in as they come, like now. Um, so we had two more slides off the last deck and I have them up here on my screen. I know you have your copies, but um, I had taken it down. I said, wait a minute, I had two more slides to do. So nephrogenic, this is under collaborative care of diabetes insipidus. And what if it's nephrogenic? So what are we doing? Well, there's no hormone to be given because we know the kidney can't respond to it, right? I mean, that's not gonna happen. A low sodium diet for sure, if your patient's conscious and they can eat, we're gonna be careful they have low sodium. Um, people who are able to drink should do that. They're gonna increase their fluids that way. They might go back to the thiazides. You remember the thiazides were contributing to SIADH before so they may actually order them now for that effect they have in losing the sodium, decreasing the GFR, slowing the urine production. And so again, many's the time I hear a nurse say, look at this patient with diabetes insipidus pouring out this urine and they've ordered a thiazide. You have to understand the mechanism behind. And we're in a teaching hospital at Maine. Ask somebody, your care and your, what you can bring to the patient bedside is better when you understand what's going on. So that people learn in teaching hospitals. That's why we have residents and PT students, OT students, nursing students, farm students. It's the great place to learn. And if it's drug related, I go to the PharmD on the unit all the time. Most ICUs have a, a pharmacist right on the unit and I go and I say, I don't know anything about this drug. You know, this is experimental, where to come from? What are we doing with it? What do we know about it? You have a sheet on it. So, you know, cause I don't know what to watch for in my patient. All right, what else can they do? They can also give you indocin. This is indomethacin. This is an NSAID by prescription. But one of the things about it is it decreases renal responsiveness. Um, I mean, increases, I'm sorry, where with diabetes insipidus, increases. I shouldn't have eaten too much sugar. Um, it's gonna increase the responsiveness. So if that's gonna help, we need that now. So let's pull indocin out. Do they have an inflammatory process? Maybe not that we know of. And you're saying to yourself, why are we giving this patient endomethacin? Ask the why, figure it out. Because that's one that, I mean, if that helps, that's great. And then be watching the urine and see if that has some outcome. So what do you do? How many times do you hear me say it? You'll hear me say it a thousand times more. Assess your patient. Assess your patient. Signs and symptoms of their fluid balance. What is going on with the fluid? Is it overload? Is it, are they dehydrated? What's happening? The eyes and nose have got to match up for you. You've got to look at it all. Check the blood pressure, check the heart rates, check the daily weights, check your urine output. You're there to monitor this patient's function and how they're doing. You got to tend to it. Don't have it be perfunctory. It's too easy for nurses to say, I did all the, the you know, um, signs on this side, or I did all my patient's neuroscience, I did all the vital signs. I did, what is it saying? What's the data telling you? It seems obvious, it's not in the thick of things when you're covering multiple patients. People let it go and they miss things like that. Specific gravities are good, INOs, daily weights. I preach daily weights all the time, it tells us a lot. So watch the blood sugars again. If we're doing CC for CC replacement and your doctor has ordered D5, that glucose can sneak up on you. It's gonna cause um, an osmotic gradient and you're gonna increase the urine output rather than decrease it. So that's something to keep in mind. All right, so our next one down, which is the page we're on. Look at that, I forgot to take lunch, you know. All right, uh, the next one down is um, thyroid. Now, more people, it's kind of a common, various issues you can have are more common with thyroid. So maybe you've come across somebody that's had that, but let's look at it. So First, we'll go to your anatomy and review. Here's your thyroid gland. They always describe it as butterfly shaped because it is, it's kind of like got these wings on both sides. It's a very, very vascular organ. Why does this matter to you? Because it matters about um, carrying modality of treatment if we're giving people meds. It matters if we've had surgery and they're bleeding all over the place. It matters if they have cancer, that's right in the blood, there's a highway everywhere. So it matters that it is a very vascular organ. So it's regulated by your thyroid stimulating hormone, which comes from your anterior pituitary, and it produces and secretes three things. Your, who's this coming in? 
You are, um, I'm sorry, I just advanced the slide on you. You are thyroxin, which is your T4. T4 is much more abundant in the body than T3, but T3 is more metabolically active. The thing about T4 is there's more of it, and in your peripheral circulation, your body can convert T4 to T3 if you need it. So we always look to T4 to make sure it's good and there's enough of it. So T4 is thyroxin. T3 is triiodothyronine, which is why we call it T3, and calcitonin. So calcitonin comes out um, to decrease, uh, it's tripped when there's, um, to tone down your calcium, to decrease your calcium levels. So it plays a little part with that. Okay, next up. So what about the thyroid gland? Well, they're the most common of all the endocrine issues, thank God, um, but, and they, we've talked about your growth and development and your metabolism and how necessary it is. And there's many, many disorders and we touch on each one of them. So we'll talk about goiter. We'll talk about benign and malignant nodules. We'll talk about thyroiditis. When you have inflammation of anything, it's an itis. Inflammation of your thyroid, same thing. And we'll talk about hyper and hypo because those are the big, the big issues. All right, so a goiter. Goiter is a Latin word for gutter. You see this space in your neck, this gully? When, it, when you have a goiter, it fills it up and closes it up. So that's where goiter comes from. It's stimulated to grow. Now, before I get too far into it, I always tell students there is a spectrum. There's no white or black, and I know you all like white or black answers. It's a very common thing in school to have, is it this or is it that? But think about this a minute, think what I'm telling you. We know iodine has a strong affinity to the thyroid gland. Iodine and thyroid are just drawn like magnets. So that's a good thing. That helps us with treatment. You'll find there's a spectrum with thyroid diseases. So sometimes we're talking about someone didn't have enough thyroid hormones, so they were hypothyroid and it made them hyperthyroid. So does this make sense? Not at first glance, but think about it. Sometimes in the compensatory mechanism of the body, if you have not enough thyroid, your body might give you a last kick and say, come on, let's overproduce, we don't have enough. And you end up in a hyperthyroid state. Likewise, people who have hyperthyroidism, eventually your thyroid peters out and is good for nothing and now you're hypothyroid. Or you've had cancer of the thyroid, we treat you, you become hypothyroid. So there's a range of things that can happen. The role that iodine plays in this is if you don't have enough iodine, it's not gonna stimulate your hormones because we need iodine to, to um, synthesize thyroid hormone. Sometimes if you have low iodine in the diet, you're gonna be hypothyroid. It stands to reason. You don't have anything to stimulate and you, you peter out, you have nothing. Sometimes a low iodine is gonna trip you into a hyperthyroid state. And it's because everybody is different. And your body's ability to compensate and rally and say, we don't have enough, let's dump it. You know, let's dump more. Or somebody else's ability to say, we don't have enough and there's nothing we can do about it. So it depends on your patient history and how they present to you. So every time we see some fluctuation, I'll say, here's an example of how you might think this would cause this, but instead it can trip that. It can get, at, just think of it on a spectrum. Thyroid disease is different for everybody and it waxes and wanes and we'll talk, we'll go through each thing. Iodine, too much or too little isn't good. We like you to have the iodine you need so your, your thyroid gland is healthy. But also knowing that iodine and the thyroid are drawn like magnets. If we need to kill your thyroid, we can radiate it and know that we're gonna give you radioactive iodine and it's gonna find those cells in your body and kill them. So we use it for too little isn't good, too much isn't good, we can use it to kill it, we can use it to suppress it, it's all dose dependent and the situation, you have to apply the concept to the situation we're talking about, okay? So here we go, now we know about a goiter, it's a big large gland. Okay, it's stimulated to grow. It can lead to hyperthyroidism because it's overstimulated and now you're in a hyperthyroid state or it's stimulated to grow and it has nothing. 
it has nothing more to give. It's growing, it's getting bigger and bigger. It doesn't have enough hormone. So you can be hypothyroid. A goiter itself does not tell you you're hyper or hypo. Now, worldwide, it's most commonly due to a lack of iodine in the diet. That's not the problem here in the United States because we have a Food and Drug Administration that monitors you get iodine support in salt. You can buy salt that is iodized or not. You have it in cereals, you have it in packaged foods, you have it, we have iodine in the diet. That's not the issue here, but it is um, an issue worldwide for sure. In the US, our problem is nodes that can overproduce or under, underproduce. Somebody will tell you, I have a node. I had nodes, they didn't do anything. I was euthyroid. I had them out, but I was euthyroid. So some people have nodes and say, oh, that threw my thyroid out of whack. I was hypothyroid from it. Really? Somebody else will say, yeah, I'm hypothyroid. I have nodes. And it's not that the patient isn't telling you the right story. It's probably true in their case. So goitrogens, this is something that can cause people issues. These are thyroid inhibiting substances. So that can cause a goiter. It can cause your thyroid gland to go out of whack. So let's look at them. Broccoli, cabbage, kale, cauliflower, all these things, it's good healthy foods, right? Nobody's saying there's anything wrong with it. But like anything we say in moderation, you know how there's something that comes out on the market and it's the new thing, you know? Kale came out, well then everything was kale, people were. And every time I saw, I saw a woman in the teeter one day, bags of kale she's putting in the cart. And I'm thinking, what is she, of course only I would do this, right? What is she doing to herself, her thyroid, all this kale? Because people think, here's a healthy thing I read about, so I'll just eat a lot of it. It's not good. It's like, you know, they came out with that fat about, um, what was it a few years back? Oh, alkaline, alkaline water. We'll market alkaline water. And people are like, well, it must be good for you, it's alkaline. Well, what does alkaline mean to somebody outside of healthcare? Not much. Somebody inside healthcare knows something acidic outside the body when it comes in, your body's gonna neutralize it. If something's too basic, your body's gonna adjust for it. So drink your water. I mean, alkaline means nothing. You know, it's not doing anything if you have a homeostatic body that's gonna make it what we need it to be. But a lot of people went out and bought it and it was a big craze and, you know, somebody gets an idea like that, they combine a little bit of science with, you know, something they think will catch on. So that was the kale deal, that's what happened here. Now, what else is a goitrogen? Look at our uh, mental health patients again. Lithium is a goitrogen. Now doctors know this when they put somebody on lithium. So one of the things they're watching when they're following the case, if people are compliant coming back for visits is, is this suppressing your thyroid? Let's do a thyroid level, because what's it doing? Amiodarone, look at this word, I-O-D-O. There's 75 elemental milligrams of something ridiculous in every tablet of amiodarone. Is it a great drug to stop dysrhythmia? Yeah. Can it pretty much mess up your thyroid? Yeah, it can. <laughs> so we know that when someone's on it because the half-life of this being what it is takes you a while to clear all that iodine, but it's right in the name. We know it's there. Salicylates, anything, not just aspirin. Think of all the people on baby aspirin, not just aspirin. But think of something, what do people buy over the counter besides aspirin? Um, um, Calpectate, you know, it's, it's a subsalicylate. It's the same thing, it's in the same family. It has that same property. So they could be taking something as innocuous as that and, and mess up their thyroid. So sulfonamides, that's sulfa drugs. They still give that for UTIs and different things. So just think about it, the different things that can affect your thyroid a lot and we need your metabolism to be good. So when we talk about goiters, what else do we say? Well, there's non-toxic goiters. These are enlarged, not from inflammation, infection, cancer. They're just enlarged. And the patient has normal thyroid levels. Now I didn't have a goiter, but I had nodes. And I was sitting one day in the office and probably playing with my necklace, like I tend to do. And I felt this lump in my neck and I was like, well, what is this? Well, you learned, I mean, I assess other people like crazy, imagine myself. You learned when you were learning about assessment that you have to assess thyroid from the back. So of course I called out who was next door to me at the time in the old building, Diane Holandos, I think. I said, come in here and assess my thyroid. And she's like, oh my God, you have a node. <laughs> yes, I do. So I went to an endocrinologist and 
you know, it turns out it was nothing. It was negative. I had them out because I had quite a few of them. And the, the type of cells they were can be either benign or malignant, and you never know till you do histology and slice up the glands. So I said, take it. That's why God made Synthroid. I'll take it every day. So anyway, they took it out, and I was fine. I was youth thyroid going in. I've been fine ever since, you know, taking a pill every morning. So anyway, so it can be, um, I didn't have a goiter, but I had nodes, and even my nodes were not toxic. It was not a problem. All right, so a nodular goiter, it can secrete hormones without TSH stimulation. So this isn't good. That's going to throw your thyroid out of whack because now, now the feedback is off. You know, it's usually a benign adenoma. A single node might do it sometime. Um, something multinodular. You can have multiple nodes in your thyroid and not even know it. I mean, if you have significant nodes, you can feel them. But if not, you know, they could be to the back of your thyroid and you can't even feel them to know they're there. So uh, they have to, you know, they'd have to bring something to bring you into the doctor, not just to say, now, if you go for a physical every year, they always check your thyroid. They should, they should be palpating it. So toxic nodular goiter is toxic because it causes hyperthyroidism. Most frequently seen after 40 years old, and it, the most common in the US is Graves' disease. And we'll talk about Graves. All right, so determining the types of goiter, what do we do? Well, they're gonna draw TSH because let's see, are you, is your gland being stimulated? I mean, is your thyroid gland even being stimulated? You need that first, is there TSH? Let's look at your T4. If everything's healthy, you should have a good amount of T4 out there. And if you need it, it can convert to three if that's what your body needs. They might do thyroid antibodies. This is TPO, thyroperoxidase. This will indicate inflammation. It'll be part of the panel they draw if they think you have something autoimmune and they're looking for antibodies that way. Um, the treatment with thyroid hormone may stop a gland from growing. Think about this. If your gland is growing, overdoing, because it doesn't have enough, and the only way your body can keep up is to keep stimulating and growing, then if we give you a certain dose of thyroid hormone, it might suppress that activity. So your, your goiter doesn't keep growing. That can happen too. Surgery, if you have a really large goiter, they'll do surgery, largely because it's gonna obstruct your airway, it can compress, it can make it hard for people to swallow. So if it's really big and boggy, they may take it out. All right, so thyroiditis, this is an inflammation, itis of anything, right? Inflammation can cause a goiter. Whatever you're exposed to can just make it inflame and it, it swells up. So you can have like a granulomatous thyroiditis, it's typically a viral thing, and it will come and go, just like you get a virus to anything else. So you think of a virus coming into your body and you'll get a head cold. You have a rhinovirus, you get a head cold. You have um, you know, a enterovirus, you get some thrown and going and you're miserable for a couple of days. But you can get a virus on any given day and it's gonna go in and sit in your thyroid. It happens to people. We had a patient last semester who had a virus and he got pancreatitis from it. And they were like, he has a viral pancreatitis. I mean, it was a run of the mill virus, it's where it got him. So. You can have that, a viral infection, and it'll be usually a subacute course, and it goes. When you're over the virus, it's gone. And acute thyroiditis are mostly what I have seen directly in practice. This is bacteria or fungus that takes over and, and um, bothers your thyroid. So when have I had it? Um, I've had people who have been you know, um, slit, their throat slit, you know, maybe, um, again, those drug deals and things. These are horrible things these people come in with. And um, I've had people who um, have been, you know, when, they're, when someone's cutting your throat, I'm sure they're not, that's not a clean blade either. Now you're opening this big vascular gland, you're going to get a whomping infection. They've had drains and all kinds of things, antibiotics, terrible. Um, what else? I have for fungus, oh my, immunosuppressed people, the transplant population, you know, your HIV people who have no immune functioning immune system to think about these AIDS patients, especially. And, you know, they could eat a piece of fruit off of a, off of a farmer's market and die from whatever's on the end of it. I mean, they have nothing when they have AIDS to defend against anything. So they get fungal infections and they get them pretty bad. 
So you can get a fungal uh, thyroiditis as well. So both the subacute and the acute occur suddenly, just like whenever you're sick with a bacterial versus a viral thing, you're fine one day and the next day you don't feel well. And if it's a virus, it'll run its course. If it's, an, if it's bacterial, you need to get an antibiotic and match the bug with the drug and kill it and hopefully you'll recover. Both of these will cause radiating pain to the jaw and the ears typically. That's kind of classic. They can have fever. It's not always sky high. Bacterial, usually very high. Um, viral, sometimes less high. And they can have chills with fever and they have fatigue. They feel miserable. But you can imagine somebody presenting to an ED who says, I have pain up to my jaw and by my ears, they're working them up for heart. I mean, they always go to the worst thing first. So they'll work them up, do an EKG. If you're not infarcting, then they'll start looking for something else. I mean, it's obvious if somebody's been you know, sliced in the throat or been knifed in a fight or something like that, it's obvious more likely what the, the problem is. Okay, so thyroiditis. Hashimoto's is a separate entity. Hashimoto's is chronic autoimmune thyroiditis. The tissue is destroyed by antibodies. We know by now how this autoimmunity works and there's so much of it, it's on the rise. It's common, it's a very common cause of hypothyroidism in this country. When you start to study eventually in other countries, it's not that way everywhere. So older white females are classically the, the demographic you see the most. So they're thinking some hormonal, some other hormonal issue with that. You know, who knows, it's not to find, but it's only suspicious. Um, people with a family history, it's not a gene, but there's some pattern of inheritance. Why is it that some people have it, their mother had it, their grandmother had it, something like that. Why do we see that familiar tendency? We don't have the answer. A goiter can develop fast with it and it can cause compression. You know, some people with a big goiter really have difficulty. Then there's silent painless goiter. You might have learned about this maternity. I don't know if they cover it. It occurs usually within six months postpartum and it can be transient, but it's something that's out there and we don't test you on this. It's a maternity thing, but they think what it is is the autoimmune reaction to fetal cells um, compared to the mom's thyroid. So, and the thought is, since we see Hashimoto's more in women, that is probably a precursor to women's women be, um, being diagnosed with Hashimoto's later in life. All right, so what's the treatment? Well, so acute or subacute, it can resolve, you know, um, sometimes with no treatment. Typically, if it's acute, you need something because it tends to be more bacterial or fungal or something and you need treatment for it. But there are documented episodes where people have had acute reaction and then it dissipates. So I can't say it's not out there. Antibiotics, drains are necessary if you have something bacterial. It's pussy and gross and miserable and they have all kinds of serous drainage and everything. So you'll see they have a big, they cut it wider to clean it out and they're on all kinds of systemic antibiotics for that. They can give NSAIDs or steroids if they think it's just a transient viral um, thyroiditis because it's gonna help the inflammatory process. And if it's viral, it's gonna give you some comfort with your fatigue and lethargy and all of that. Now here's propranolol again, our beta blocker that keeps on giving. Now this is a beta blocker, a tenolol is a beta blocker. So this is given in thyroid patients for thyroid stimulated heart rate. So if your patient is symptomatic of whatever their thyroid condition, it's usually a hyper, that they're having a rapid heart rate, that's not a, a comfortable feeling to have, we can put them on a beta blocker. And it's gonna just dull that beta response a little bit and spare them at least that aspect of adding this extra symptom. It doesn't do anything to thyroid disease, not at all. Okay, thyroid hormone replacement, if you know we say you're hypothyroid now, even if you were hyper, and they're watching you and watching you and doing your regular bloods and now you're hypo, we're gonna replace it. We're gonna give you levothyroxine or Synthroid so that you have what you need to have your body's metabolism function. You have to teach people to be compliant. They need to take thyroid meds on an empty stomach. Some doctors tell them take it late at night before you go to bed when you have nothing in your stomach. A lot of doctors say wake up first thing in the morning and take it on an empty stomach. They have to have an empty stomach, no other pills or food with it, 
and don't drink it with grapefruit juice. I mentioned before in the beginning when I was talking about seizures and things, grapefruit juice does not play well with other medications. Stay away from it. And in doing teaching with students by the bedside with patients, we'll be going over a list of things and I can't tell you how many people say, I know I can't have grapefruit juice, so I eat a grapefruit instead. It's the same thing, only different. Stay away from the grapefruit when the whole grapefruit family, when you are taking your meds, it interferes with its absorption. Okay, so what's the nursing care? We tell people, we teach them, you have to have stakeholder buy-in. They have to be part of this for them to comply. They have to take the med. And if they've been hypothyroid and they're taking Synthroid supplement and they're feeling better, what happens? Well, I feel great now. I don't need that. I feel great. You're feeling great because you take the Synthroid, you know? So you have to hit them with compliance every time you get a chance. They should not stop that medication suddenly. If they see they're running low, call the doctor and get another prescription. Most pharmacies now do it on a rotation that they call you a couple of weeks ahead or they'll text you a couple of weeks ahead to say, you still on this medication? You still want it? And if you don't, if you don't pick it up, they send a message back to the doctor saying, Susie did not pick up her med. So they're trying to close that loop, you know? All right, any breathing, any swallowing diff you know, difficulty at all, they should call the doctor, tell the doctor about it. It could mean the goiter's getting bigger or conditions have changed. If they have swelling of the face or limbs or weight loss or anything like that, it might not be enough thyroid hormone. We need to know this, so tell them what to look for. Patients with Hashimoto's, because it is autoimmune, are at risk for other autoimmunes. Don't see your patient admitted with one autoimmune disease and it doesn't make you look or at least consider others that might be there. All right, so hyperthyroidism. This is the other way now, this is too much, too much. Hyperactivity of the thyroid. It's increasing synthesis, increasing release. Why is this happening? We don't know. We don't know why it's you and not the person next to you. We know it's more men than women. We can assume that that's you know, hormonally based, but we don't know. The average age is 20 to 40, but we do see it as people age as well. The average age is 20 to 40. That's basically childbearing, give or take a few years. So the most common form in this country is Graves, when we're talking hyperthyroid. And it's what, um, who had it? The older Mrs. Bush, white-haired Mrs. Bush, the first judge, his wife had it. it. was all over the news at the time, a big thing. Other causes, thyroiditis. Maybe it came and it inflamed, and even though the inflammation is down, you're just overproducing. Maybe it's a toxic nodular goiter. That's what's toxic about it. It makes you hyperthyroid. You didn't know you had a node, but now you're hyperthyroid and you're shaky and you feel jittery and your heart rate's up and you see the doctor and they say, you have a thyroid issue. Could be a toxic nodular goiter. Excess iodine intake. You could be taking too much iodine in the middle, in, in the meals, because somebody told you at the health food store, iodine's a great supplement. You might already have enough. You might be one of the kale people <laughs> that's eating a lot of kale and broccoli and whatnot. And now you're taking an iodine supplement? Just because it comes from the health food store doesn't make it healthy. So be careful, excess iodine intake could make you hyperthyroid. Pituitary tumors, because they can excrete it. They're, they're pushing TSH out there. They could just be releasing tons of it. And if you have a healthy thyroid, it's gonna respond and give you Tons and tons of thyroid hormone that you don't need. Thyroid cancer, the same thing. And thyroid cancer takes it out of the loop because now those thyroid, those diseased thyroid cells can secrete their own without control. So it's, it's, um, it's a dicey thing. So they can be precipitated by contrast scans. This is not difficult. You've learned about contrast dye. It's iodine-based. People have an allergy to iodine can't take contrast in their scans. So the same thing here, your patient, we think nothing of people going down, she's going down for CT with contrast for this and this and that, no one bats an eye on the floor. They could all develop thyroid problems after that. The nurses who are out working should know that, they should be watching for it. You know, so think about the implications of what we do day to day. 
All right, so thyroid toxicosis, that was, this was always called thyroid storm. It still is. I hear it all the time in the ICUs. Um, so this is acute. This is severe hyperthyroidism. It's rare, thank God, because we, we take all the steps we know to mitigate it. But it's out there, and it's life-threatening. This is an abrupt onset. It's a sudden release of thyroid hormones. Now, what precipitates it? What's the cause of this? Well, stress. Now, there's stress in everybody's life. We're not talking like, you know, stress of a divorce or stress of a, God forbid, a death of a loved one or something, or 202 stress. We're not minimizing 202 stress, but it's not that kind of stress. We're talking a stress like um, a really badly burned patient, 60, 70% burns. That's an enormous tax, stressful tax on the body when it's your thyroid gland that's responsible to keep your metabolism going. Um, somebody's a really bad trauma patient and not doing well. You know, we're talking demands on the body, a really acute, infe acute infection, like a bad um, sepsis or something, really bad. So what do they have? They get extreme fever, which we could attribute to an infection they have, not necessarily just the high thyroid. It could be then they have tachycardia, that comes with fever. So, you know, we can't just look at things and say, oh, I can explain this and I can explain that. We have to think, what else? And you know, even in the ICUs, we're not drawing TSHs every day, T4s, not every day. So we have to think of the other possibilities. That's how you contribute to care. So tremors, seizures from all this hyped up metabolism absolutely can happen. Sometimes the patients have a loss of mental acuity that's a change in level of consciousness. That's an indicator of a lot of problems on any level. They can be and delirious. They can be in a coma. So usually by that point, when they see that big an issue, they're doing comprehensive bloods and they can usually pick it up. But otherwise, because we know it has to be a severe release of hyperthyroid, uh, hyperthy uh, come on, Jane, thyroid hormone, we're looking at the patient and how they came in. Is this somebody who, um, I don't know, tried to hang themselves from a tree, had neck compression, something that would have caused release of thyroid hormone? I had a patient like that once. Is it my patients I have had, sad to say, more than one who've had their neck split, their throat cut open? Is it, um, that's leaching hormone everywhere. And remember how vascular the thyroid is we're cutting open this organ, it's leaching out. Sometimes, and this is another way we mitigate it, if we know we're gonna go in and take out your big boggy goiter, they try and treat you ahead of time to reduce the vascularity. By them trying to detach it from your parathyroid glands, which are buried in the back, and do all this manipulation, it used to be in that post-op patient, we had thyrotoxic crisis all the time because they'd have a thyroid surgery and they'd come in totally out of whack from all that leaching of thyroid. We do better now to mitigate that, but it's always a possibility. You're manipulating the gland. Okay, so let's look at Graves. Now this is 75% of hyperthyroidism cases in this country. That's pretty significant. It's autoimmune. We know women are five times more likely than men. Thank you, Eve, whatever the cause of that is. It's a very diffuse, large thyroid gland. And we know that the antibodies are attaching to the receptors and there's over secretion in Graves' disease of T3 and T4. We know that the both of them are just over secreted. It can remit and exacerbate without treatment. It's hard to imagine. But sometimes people feel awful and they get all these symptoms of it and they're like, I need an appointment with the doctor. And they call and make an appointment and by the time they go, they don't feel that bad that day. And the doctor doesn't see anything particularly out of whack. And maybe the bloods don't reflect too much. And then they don't feel well again. So it can go in back and forth. And they might suspect it's that, but it can go back and forth. Um, precipitating risk could be a decrease in iodine. Why? This, could, this is one of those confusing points. Because in the case of Graves' disease, already you have an immune system that's, that's not acting normal, okay? Now, in somebody else, low iodine might prompt their gland to say, okay, let me overperform. But because this is Graves' disease, 
and you have antibodies that are rejecting this gland, it's not doing that so much. So the decrease in iodine can cause them to just act aberrantly because the whole situation is aberrant. Remember, this is based on the fact that their um, gland is not being recognized normally by the body. There's a problem to begin with. So low iodine can trip this. The body's just gonna kind of go out of whack and kind of overproduce. And it can also be infection. It can be a systemic infection. It can be even an infection like a tooth abscess or anything that affects your uh, working metabolism and the demand on your body. It can be genetic factors. We don't know what the genetic factor is. There's no single pattern. There's variation, but we can see some trends familiarly. We're in the loss about that. Smoking, long-term smokers, because there's a certain amount of cyanide when people smoke cigarettes, and that creates thiocyanide, which creates a problem with thyroid glands. So Graves' disease can cause thyrotoxicosis. You're, you're overstimulating. You have tons of T3 and T4 being leached out. That's a problem. So it's over-secreting, and the body can all of a sudden be in this acute thyrotoxic um, situation. So you have to be careful. Graves' disease will eventually lead to hypothyroidism. What we've seen in cases like this is that it, the gland just poops out after a while. And even if they, it doesn't poop out on its own, whatever they're giving you for treatment to control it will eventually wear your thyroid gland down to a point where you become hypothyroid. And then you're back taking Synthroid. Okay? All right. What do you see? Well, with this excess hormone, you're going to see a goiter. That's the first thing you'll see. And these goiters have brewies. What's a brewie? Who remembers what a brewie is? Anybody? It's like a sound where it, um, it's like where there's, I think it's turbulence in the in yeah. blood flow. Good, Jonathan. Yeah. It's, it's a French word for noise. So it's turbulence. You can hear a brewie if someone has carotid arteries with a lot of plaque in them. You know, you work on a cardiac floor and they say, yeah, this patient needs bilateral carotidectomies. They have, you know, all this plaque inside. Go listen. Listen and hear the swishing in the carotids. It's turbulent. You see, uh, we check for a brewery and a fistula where we've joined an artery and a vein so that someone can dialyze. You can hear the noise, it's, it's a brewery. So this, this um, gland is so vascular that when it gets this big, it has a brewery. If you, you'll see endocrinologists come in and put a stethoscope to it. And you think they're listening for carotid, that would probably be a little higher up if they have this big goiter. But you listen to the goiter, it's swishing. So that's not a good thing. You know, that's a big goiter. Now, exophthalmus, the eyes bulge out. They look like um, Boston Terrier eyes, like kind of, they bulge out. And this is the fat deposits and fluid accumulation behind the eyeball. Sometimes it makes such a change, it stretches so much that the oculomotor muscles start going a little off and people complain of double vision sometimes because they're at the pressure that's behind the eye. It's a, it's a very noticeable thing. I have been places with people and I just look up and I'm like, wow, you know, someone's exophthalmus is that noticeable. Tachycardia, bounding pulse. Hyper is going to give you everything in hyperdrive. High heart rate, uh, diarrhea, too much GI stimulation. They have diarrhea. They lose weight from the speed up metabolism. They're irritable. Their hands are shaky. It looks like they're nervous all the time, but it's stimulated. They have flush skin and they're always hot because the furnace is burning in overdrive. They're tired from this hyper state. They get muscle weakness and they even get um, edema. The, the blood is pumping so fast, they start collecting fluid. And osteoporosis, high thyroid levels can interfere with your body's ability to store calcium in the bone. So we start seeing osteoporosis in people who have been hyperthyroid for a while. So it's, um, it's not good. One thing goes off and it affects the whole body. I think this course is really focused on having you see how much the hip bone connects to the thigh bone, you know, how something goes wrong in one place and, you know, it affects everything else. All right. So here's some pictures. This over here is a comedian, uh, Marty Feldman from, he's gone years ago. 
This woman is not bulging her eyes, obviously. This is her. So you can see, you can see the tops of her, eye, of her corneas. You can see the whites of her eyeball. This is exophthalmic. This woman is too. You can see the whites of her eye up here, even here. And look at this goiter. She's got a goiter. So, and he has a disconjugate gaze. See how his eyes do not, you know, come together. Um, that could have easily been fixed. You can fix that in children. Um, they tighten the ocular muscles around the eye and they fix it. But it's hard for parents to think to subject their babies to that kind of surgery. It's very easy now. They do it with laser. Okay, um, here's another graphic of hyperthyroidism. If you are a visual learner, this may help you with uh, everything in hyperdrive and losing weight and, you know, diarrhea and all of that. Okay, so diagnostics, what do we do? We always go back to the bloods, TSH and free T4. Let's look at the TSH. Is this being stimulated? You know, are the, are the levels low or are they high? What's happening? And T4, the two of them together are the most accurate indicators of thyroid function. So free T3 and free T4 are the metabolically active ones. But four we focus on more because you rely on four to peripherally convert to three if you need it. So you gotta be sure you got four, which is why they always look at four. Total T3 and T4, I'm not saying it's not on a thyroid panel. I'm saying it doesn't tell them much. Uh, thyroid antibodies, that's your TB, the TPO. They can do thyroglobins. They can do um, all kinds of um, antibodies and things like that on an antibody panel. They can do a thyroid scan, an ultrasound, pardon me, biopsies. When I felt my node and I got a hold of the endocrinologist, I went over on a lunch hour right before curriculum. And I said to him, I have this node, I have this node. So he said, let me scan it and see. And he did, a, um, he did an ultrasound first. And I'm looking at the ultrasound. He's like, look away. I said, no, I just want to, I mean, I don't speak ultrasound. I don't read them. Obviously, that's not my thing. But if I have anatomical markers, I can give it a bit, as good a shot as the next person. So I'm looking and looking and he's like, look away. So on the one side, I could tell they were cysts because it looks like Swiss cheese. Like your gland is all the part of cheese and the cysts are clear and you can see right through them. So I could see that. I was like, well, that's not bad. I'm not worried about that. And I mean, I could feel it. So obviously they were big enough, but I wasn't too worried. Then he said, let me check the other side. And he went over the other side and they were solid things. And I'm like, what? And he's going like this. And I'm going, what? And he's going like, and I'm like, what are we looking at here? And they were dark around them, looked like they had a little blood supply. I'm like, what is this? He said, all right, lay back. I'll do some biopsies. And it's nothing. They spray your skin. You don't even feel it. And they take these long, long needles and they put them in. And I, of course, of me, you can imagine by now I had a list of things. Don't stick my carotid. Don't stick my trachea. Don't stick my recurrent laryngeal nerve or I won't speak again. You know, I had a whole list of things for him. And he's like, oh, okay, Jamie, put your head back. <laughs> so they, they took the biopsies. Now, a good example of how you always have to be careful to how you speak in front of patients. The nurse, the assistant, whoever it was, was in there helping him. She's setting up the slides for biopsy, and he's sticking these big, long needles in my neck, and I don't feel anything. I'm just waiting for it to be done. And he gives her a slide, and she said, I got it. And he gives her another slide. She said, I got it. He gives her another one, and he said, okay, I'll take a few more. She said, you want more? And I'm lying there on the table like, that didn't sound very good. Like he doesn't usually do more than that, you know? So he just put his hand out and she gave him another one and he did some of that. And he said, uh, he put his hand out again and she said, you still need more? Now I'm the patient, you know? I'm like, now maybe somebody else wouldn't pick up on that, but I did. I was in healthcare and I did. And I was like, this doesn't sound good. So I said to him, what are we looking at? And he said, I think we're looking at nothing, honestly, but we'll see. And the next day, he said, they're probably nothing. The kind of cells I had were typical for my age. And they, as I said, I was euthyroid, but they're the kind of cells that can be either. And the only way you know is to histologically break up the gland. So I said, out they come. My brother was dying at the time of thyroid cancer. And I said, too close for comfort. So out they came, but the biopsies were nothing. They don't bother you at all. All right, what do we do for the hyperthyroid diagnostics? The TSH levels will be decreased. 
Why does this make sense? If your gland is in overdrive and is over secreting from an autoimmune disease or a, a tumor or something that's happened to it, it's not waiting on the thyroid, the, the pituitary gland to tell it to do anything. It's just dumping on its own. So TSH levels are likely suppressed. T4 levels are up because the gland is producing it on its own. The T3 and T4 aren't telling us anything. But by now they might do radioactive iodine uptake. Now I told you before, we can radioactivate iodine and give it to you if you have thyroid cancer. And when you ingest it, it's gonna go all over the body and kill the cells. But this isn't enough to kill them. This is just enough to find them. So they can differentiate, let's say Graves disease, from a simple thyroiditis. If you're, even if you're in a hyperthyroid state from both of them, they're trying to figure it out. So let's look at a scintigraphy so you see what I'm talking about. So here, oh, so touchy, can't even touch the screen. Okay, here is just, I know it's kind of a fuzzy picture, but here's kind of a thyroid gland that is just has enough to uptake to let us see what a normal thyroid gland looks like. This one is darker and denser. This patient is hyperthyroid, so it lights up more. This, you see all these bumps. This is multinodular. Looks like they're throughout both sides of this butterfly gland. This is a single node. This is thyroiditis. So these both can be making you hyperthyroid, but look at the difference. This is very little uptake. This is just an inflammation. This is likely disease. So that's why they go to these kind of tests to differentiate um, thyroiditis from you know, another cause, another reason for you to be so hyperthyroid. Okay, so what's the collaborative care? Well, we're trying to stop the effects of the overproduction. You know, what, this is putting your body under inordinate amount of stress to be in hyperdrive like this. So what's gonna stop it? We'll give you antithyroid medications, we can give you radioactive iodine therapy if we have to kill something, if you have a cancer, or we can go in and take your thyroid out. They take part of your thyroid, they leave part, they take the whole thing. That would be subtotal versus total. Now, he said to me, you're a thyroid. Your gland is functioning perfectly, but we won't really know if those cells, <coughs> pardon me, that are, um, that we've identified are the cause of you feeling these nodes if they are definitely benign or malignant until we slice them up. Well, have at it, take it out, slice it up. But, so I said, take the whole thing. He said, well, the one side with cysts, you want me to leave it? Maybe it gives you enough thyroid, you don't have to take anything. I've seen too many patients who have half a thyroid out and still have to take Synthroid. Again, everyone makes their own decision, risk benefit, right? But in my case, with my brother dying of thyroid cancer, too close for comfort, my option was take it out. And I was glad, I thank God I didn't have it. He was glad, my brother, that I didn't have what he had. And you know, it, it was fine. But a total thyroidectomy can happen and you can live fine afterwards. You know, I had a whole laundry list of things for them going into surgery too. <laughs> okay, so choice of therapy is gonna depend. How old is the patient? How sick is the patient? Is this someone really elderly who has a bad heart and needs a, an aortic valve replacement or somebody who has no kidney function and all that? I mean, what are we looking at? What, a, how, what is the best way to approach this? And is this a pregnant lady or not? Can't give you radioactive anything and kill your thyroid if you're pregnant. All right, so antithyroid therapy, we'll do this slide, I'll give you a break. Um, antithyroid therapy, first line antithyroid drugs. They go straight to PTU. This is propothiouracil, and this is gonna inhibit synthesis of the hormones quickly, quickly. It's, it's a good drug. It blocks the peripheral conversion of four to three. So we don't want you on it forever in a day, but for now, we're gonna give it to you and see if it can't get you under control. Another one they can give you is methamazole. This is tapazole. It's very commonly given. This, you don't feel signs of improvement for two, maybe three weeks. You feel much better, maybe up to two months down the road. So what do you do in the meantime? They might have all these symptoms of hyperthyroid. I had a graduate student come work with me one time. She was trying to learn how to be a nursing educator. And she was with me for one of her courses. And she comes in and she's 
oh my God, I can't stand my heart rate. And she's carrying on and on and on. And I said, what in the world? So I'm assessing her. Of course, I had a cuff. I took a blood pressure. I checked her pulse. I said, are you hyperthyroid? And she said, yeah. And I said, what are you taking? And she said, methmazole. But I don't take it. It doesn't do any good. Excuse me. <laughs> what in the world? I said, it won't kick in. How long have you been on it? A week. Get back on your methmazole. What are you doing? And so I said to her, listen to me. Pick up my phone right now. Call your doctor and say you need a beta blocker. She said, feel my heart is going like 150. I said, you can't stay like this. You can't stay. And she was a nurse. So don't think about what we do naturally for ourselves because she clearly was not thinking. But what can we, what really was the problem here? It wasn't that the med didn't make her feel better because had she listened or had she thought about it, tapazole is gonna take a while, it takes a couple of weeks. But if what you don't like is the symptoms, the flush, the heart rate and all of that, get a prescription for your patient, get some beta block, a little propranolol, will dull that, she won't have to be on it forever, but dull that, and then you can take your regimen. I mean, so 20 to 40% per, per percent of people on average, they think have spontaneous remission. So after they've had some treatment, it just stops and they go back to normal and they have some measure of thyroid. Non-compliance is big as evidenced by my grad students <laughs> who wasn't taking her methmazole. I said, you'd rather stay in a state that's doing nothing to help you to ever make this better and sit here thinking you're dying of tachycardia. I mean, crazy. So non-compliance is a big, big issue. We can use this in the graves and in pregnancy and the need to get somebody to be euthyroid before surgery so we don't put them in thyrotoxic crisis. That's what they do here. Okay. I'll see you at the top of the hour. It's not lunchtime this time. <laughs> I'll see you back at the top. Okay, so I stopped with how we can use it for graves in pregnancy and people that need to be thyroid. It's one of the ways we, we mitigate that risk of thyrotoxicosis. We've learned that the hard way over time. Okay, um, another thing. Here it comes up, antithyroid and it's iodine. So think back what I told you before. We know iodine has a strong affinity like a magnet to the thyroid gland, right? And it needs it to produce hormones. So this will be dose dependent. This will be a higher dose. They know that your body, your thyroid specifically is gonna react to um, iodine. So they're gonna put it at a higher dose and they could use it with other drugs. They might use it in a thyrotoxic crisis, depending on the shape you're in. But it's gonna inhibit T3 and T4 because it's so much, the thyroid doesn't know what to do with it. So it blocks the release. It also decreases the vascularity of the gland we find when it's in a high dose. So that's helpful. The thing is the maximum effect, one to two weeks. So it's not a quick fix. If this is someone who really needs response quicker than that because of compression or they're not going to risk an airway with this, they'll go to something else that's more rapidly acting. But if they're going to be in for the long haul and they can do this periodically, it's good. Now, it does have reduced effect long term. So they'll only give you so much before the thyroid is like, yeah, I've seen it before. Not a big deal. So they're careful about that. What they use is saturated solution of potassium iodine or Lugol solution. Both of them are pretty gross. I mean, I've never had to have them, but they're gross. Do patients tell me, blah, terrible. Even putting them in juice or whatever doesn't really matter. But they're both used for um, like preserving slides in the lab and all. I mean, it's pretty chemically tasting. It's not the best thing. If your patient is on this for multiple weeks, they can get toxic reactions to the mouth. They get like a stomatitis. They get swelling of the mucosa or their parotid glands are inflamed and they salivate a lot or sometimes they get rashes from it. So sometimes they cannot continue with this dose over divided doses over time. So it may not work for them that way. They'll just get sensitive to it, but it's an option. The other therapy we've talked about is the beta adrenergic blockers. This will do nothing to your thyroid gland. It's only working as symptomatic relief for symptoms related to hyperthyroid. 
So it's going to block that sympathetic nervous stimulation at your beta receptors, right? At the adrenergic receptor. And they can use it in conjunction with, um, you know, um, thyroid drugs or, you know, something else they're giving you, like my grad student who should have been taking her methmazole and take her propanolol with it. Now, the thing about some beta blockers, you know, uh, can cause bronchospasm and asthmatics and all, so we have to be careful of that. And your cardiac patients, we don't want to slow a heart rate down that, you know, they, they can't do well on it. Um, so they watch the kind of dose they give you for this too, but, and then they, we have to watch how the patient reacts to it. And is it helpful or is it not? Then we'll go to something else. So they have options with treatment. Okay. Antithyroid, another one, is the radioactive iodine I spoke about. Now, this is a treatment of choice. If you are not pregnant, it's going to, we're radioactivating the iodine that we give you to ingest. It's going to, with its affinity, go find those cells wherever they are. So, and it's going to destroy them. So that's good. When my brother was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, he had a huge goiter. We were all at dinner up at one of their houses. They're all up in Massachusetts. And we were at dinner at one of the houses. And one of my brothers, my brothers are physicians. This brother that had the cancer was a financial planner. Go figure. They like him too, to have him around. <laughs> but um, one of them kicked me in the shin. It was like, you know, pointing their head, like, look at Bill. You know, I look over at Bill. He's got this huge goiter. He couldn't, he couldn't button his shirt. His goiter was so big. So, of course, the other brother starts asking, and they're all asking him about it. He goes, yeah, yeah, I got this. They scan it every six months because it's large, but it doesn't cause me compression and, you know, blah, blah, it's fine. Well, that was well and good. So every six months, he was getting scanned, and probably two, three years they did this and never moved an inch, nothing. And they said, it's just the way it is. Your thyroid levels are good, not a problem, blah, blah. So one November, he was supposed to get his December scan. He had it done in November because of all the holidays and up in Boston, they get bad weather and whatnot. So he had it done in November and um, he, it was negative. So in May, when he was supposed to have it done again, in the meantime, he gets a shoulder ailment. His shoulder's killing him. He works out all the time and everything. And I had just had my shoulder completely resected. And he thought he had what I had. You know, I was athletic my whole life and it was about time my shoulder blew and I had to have it all resected. So he called me and he said, I think I have Janie disease, you know, a nice way of older brother to talk to a young sister. <laughs> he said, my shoulder hurts. I've been, you know, I'm on the um, stair step or whatever. He does 45 minutes on the stair step or everything's fine. But if I do anything with my arm repetitively, I have a pain in my humerus. So my other brother sends him to an orthopod. They do an x-ray and they see a mass on his bone. What he had was a pathological fracture in his arm there was already a tumor there and it had started to crack the bone and that's what was giving him a problem. So they biopsied it and all of that, it was thyroid cells. And he said, I, when they said, when did you have your last scan? This was March when he was diagnosed. He said, I had it in November. They pulled up the scan, scan was negative. In March, he obviously had stage four and it was already in his arm. So then they did a body scan. They found it was in his pelvis, everywhere. So he had a very rapid onset and it was, it was thyroid cancer and a heartbeat. So they would give him this radioactive iodine and what was good is it's gonna go find those cells wherever. They would do another scan and there was far less, they had to replace his humerus with a rod, but they would you know, look at his pelvis, there was less cancer there. They would look at the tissue, there was less cancer. So it went out and it found it and killed it, which was good. It's just, he, would, he was diagnosed when it was already stage four. So that was his biggest um, issue. So what else? There's a very high treatment of post-treatment hypothyroidism. You can imagine we're sending it out to kill thyroid cells. So they're not going to work anymore. So after about six, eight months of treatment, they were giving him thyroid therapy. And he said, is this crazy? I mean, I had so much thyroid and now look at me. And I said, you got to do it. Here's the, here's the thing. So delayed response. So they might need other drugs. We use adjuvant therapy in the meantime. Your endocrinologist will look at your patient and say, they'll, we'll give them this. In the meantime, they'll need a beta blocker. In the meantime, we'll be doing this, but we'll give them a little methamazole every day. We'll get, you know, they'll combine therapies to keep the person so the body is not wearing out in this hypothyroid state. So the radioactivity is very low. It's done as an outpatient. He was home. I think the doctor said to him, 
you know, the standard thing is flush the toilet twice if you live with other people and because, you know, you lose it in your waste. Um, you know, it, there was really no standard um, warning, warning, this is radioactive, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so what can happen? Radiation therapy. You can get thyroiditis, parotiditis with that. You can get um, dry mouth with that. So what do we do? We do all the little concoctions they have in the hospital. You know how you do baking soda and water, or you do, we do gargles for patients up on the floor. We do a third of mouthwash and a third of water and a third of, you know, something else. And we mix it all together and, and give them whatever is palatable. If they have any kind of stomatitis or parotiditis or any kind of um, anything that's sore to the mouth, it helps. They can, the doctor would have to order Mylanta um, Maalox for them to swallow. If they're having radiation to the neck, it can give them um, some soreness down the esophagus. So we can give them Mylanta Maalox, swishes and swallow. They give them um, diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, and viscous lidocaine to swish and spit. We don't have them swallow it or they can't feel themselves swallowing. Uh, but at home, they'll say flush the toilet several times, you know. The, there are guidelines in Lewis that say separate the food, the laundry, all of that stuff. In, in practice, you don't see them do that. Okay, so surgical therapy, we're going to go in and get that thyroid out. It's cancerous, it's causing you compression, it's jagundo, um, boggy goiter, it's going to come out. So if people are non-responsive to therapy, if they've tried things and it's not working, in the case of cancer, they gave my brother all this therapy. They still went in and took the gland out, but they waited to decrease the vascularity of the size of it, shrink the, the goiter down some so we don't risk him being in thyrotoxic crisis. You know, do what we can to control it, and then it still has to come out because it's cancerous and it's vascular. So it's a super highway for cancer cells. And that's what he kept saying to me. They're not taking it out yet. They want to fix my arm first. They want to do this first and give me radioactive iodine and all of this, they're not taking it out. I still have cancer in me. And I think anyone who's seen cancer patients understand that feeling that if cancer's in me, get it out. You know, they just want it gone. And, but there's things we have to do to avoid this thyrotoxic crisis. So a subtotal, of course, is just taking out some of it and not um, all of it, or they might go in and take it all. Endoscopic, I've seen that more when they're taking out a singular node, like there's one nodular toxic nodule and they go in endoscopically underneath and they take it out. Um, it might be done more frequently than that. We just don't see it at Maine. So making the patient you thyroid can help before surgery. So they do what they can to get your levels under control because of the thyrotoxic crisis. Okay, so nutritional therapy. In a hyperthyroid state, we feed people in the hospital. <laughs> I don't know if they calorie count at home, but you're four or 5,000 calories in the hospital because they're just burning right through it. And we don't want them cachectic. You know, we know what it is you have and we're trying to control whatever the culprit is, but we can't have, a new be, we can't have you be catabolic in the process. So they will support them. Whether they eat all that much is a different thing, but nutrition will send them you know, trays full of food, snacks in between, everything just to keep them going. Full meals, high protein, uh, high carbs, vitamin supplements if they need it. We're trying to satisfy hunger, you know. We don't give them highly seasoned foods. They might like pepper, they might like whatever. They won't do that. They won't give them a lot of high fiber, which means we have to be sure they're pooping. Because if we stimulate the GI, it's adding to the process. They're already in a hypermetabolic state. So we want them to poo, just not have so much stimulation that's causing diarrhea. No caffeine. And they will say, I have my cup of coffee every morning. Not nah, when you're hypermetabolic, you're not. We don't need to add to that because caffeine is going to increase heart rate. Okay. Dr. Benetti? Yes. Did you say no high fiber foods or we will encourage high fiber foods? I'm sorry. No, okay because it's going to stimulate the bile to empty and the person gets hungry again and they're already in a hypermetabolic state they can have diarrhea so while fiber can help bulk diarrhea in this case it's where fiber is working to help you poo and they're already pooing too much so they try not to give them fiber that way mm -hmm. yeah so we have to be sure they're pooping and usually it's not a problem 
in a hyperthyroid patient. Did I advance the slide too quick? Yes. Um, in a hyperthyroid patient, because they usually have diarrhea. Okay, so what do you do? Treat it as an outpatient. Thyrotoxicosis patients are in the ICU. They're very sick. Assess your patient. Meds as ordered to block the thyroid hormone production. Don't be saying, oh, they're off the floor. Oh, they're here. Oh, they're there. And they need the dose of drug. Don't be lazy. O2, watch the IVs, watch the electrolytes, watch the EKGs. You have a hyperthyroid patient. Heart rate is high. Metabolic rate is high. Big demand on the heart. Depending on their age and their underlying mortality, they could, they could infarct over this. So you got to watch your patients. Um, keep a calm, cool, quiet environment. They're already jittery and stressed. If you really see them in a hyperthyroid state, they can't stay still. It's terrible. Oftentimes, they need eye protection. If they have exophthalmus, they might not be able to close the lid to protect the eye. It might not close all the way. If that's the case, we put wetting drops and we put a gauze cover. At night, we put a little tin. You know, there's a form that goes on the eye. Elevate the head of the bed. It tends to help them with their rapid heart rate and all. It helps the eye drain the fluid to lessen the uh, exophthalmus while they're in the hospital. Skin care. Don't forget skin care. Think of the basics you learned in 110. Skin care is important. This is a patient who's in a hypermetabolic state who's likely diaphoretic a lot. Don't leave people with damp skin. They're going to break down. There's bacteria on your skin. Bathe your patients. Nothing is beneath nurses. That is your basic nursing care. Bathe your patients. Take care of their skin. Dietary support, patient education. They might not know about this. They don't want this. They want it gone. It takes a lot of time trying to explain to them so they understand and can cope with this. Okay, post-op complications. Hypothyroidism is the biggest one. There, you take that gland out, they're suddenly hypothyroid. So the other thing is we're going to treat them for that. They'll wait a couple of days because you have enough circulating hormone from the leaching of it that it should be okay. But then they'll start you on Synthroid. Um, the other thing is damage or removal of the parathyroid glands. Parathyroid glands are four tiny little beans that are embedded in the back of your thyroid gland. And they can very easily lose them. If they go in for a big boggy thyroid, they'll take it out and then they're fishing in the gland to get these, if it's grown up and over your parathyroids, they're fishing to dig them out. They don't mind, they take the time in the OR because they don't want to leave you with issues now with your parathyroid gland. But how much manipulation can they do of this big boggy gland before they put the patient at risk for thyrotoxicosis? So they're going to do what they can so that they get the parathyroids out. So of course, when I gave the laundry list, when the surgeon said to me, anything bother you, Mrs. Benetti, about the surgery? <laughs> yes, I want to wake up from anesthesia, number one. I want to wake up without a trach in my throat because how many countless thyroid patients did I have who were in the ICU with trachs? Because their airway, so much surgery and it swells and they lose their airway and their trach. I said, I don't want a trach. I said, I don't want you to damage my recurrent laryngeal nerve because I want to talk the rest of my life. You know, I'm going down a laundry list, she's laughing. But it was all true, but you know, they watch for all that stuff. And I said, don't damage my parathyroids. I don't want more problems. This is elective. I don't want more problems after this. So hemorrhage is another thing. We, it's a vascular, vascular organ, and we've taken it out. And there's blood supply that feeds it, capillaries, you know, small vessels, big vessels, all in your neck. So bleeding is a big issue. You have to be careful. And the thing is with thyroid patients, they'll come back, they'll have a dressing over their neck where their thyroid was removed. I mean, I'm talking somebody with a big goiter. My, my incision was a half a centimeter long. My gauze was maybe, you know, one inch across. But somebody who had a big goiter that had to come out, it has a much bigger incision. So they're laying back and they have a dressing over it. Which way do you think the blood is going to flow if it's bleeding? It's going to go down your back. It's not coming out the front. So you can't just look at your patient who's in low filers or whatever and say, oh, look, the dressing looks good. Turn that patient over and be sure the blood is not leaking down the back and all the way down their back, down their spine. You know, we don't want them bleeding and you don't see it. So you got to look. Okay. Um, 
what else? Paralyzed co vocal cords can cause a spastic airway. So that's a big problem here. And what they do is they have a trach set ready somewhere. Now, when I went in and had mine done, they wanted me to stay overnight. They were worried about my airway. They wanted me to stay overnight. And so my family was with me for a long time. And my old teaching partner at the time, she's now head of a nursing program somewhere else. But she said, I am coming at night and I'm keeping my, my eyes on you because I don't want something to happen. You know, so she comes in to sit with me and I'm looking all over the room. I don't see the tray kit anywhere. And I know there has to be one and they're nowhere. And I'm thinking, this is wonderful. Here I am within teammate in the system. I'm in here and they don't even put a tray set in my room. And she comes in, she's ripping the room apart. She can't find it anyway. So we both get the nurse when she comes in. I said, where's my tray kit? She said, we have it outside the door. We thought it would make you nervous. I said, it's making me more nervous that... You know, if I had a thyroid, I'd be hyperthyroid by this point, worrying about where the trach set is. So they keep a trach set nearby, just in case. All right, so post-op care. Assess your patient. Laryngeal nerve damage. This is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. It's as big as a hair, and it goes through your um, thyroid gland, and it regulates your speech. So if that's irritated, it can lead to spasms and strider in your larynx. And this is an airway problem. It could be related to tetany. They've damaged the parathyroids. The patient's suddenly hypocalcemic and they're having tetany. Watch for signs of hypoparathyroidism. Check your patient, Shavaz Tech and Trousseau. What is Shavaz Tech? Which one is that? Shavasana. Is that where the is that where the hands are? No, kind of is the cheek. Think of C H Shavasana, C H for cheek. You're gonna flick the cheek, and it cramps up. Trousseau is the one that they're putting the BP cuff on you, and your hand cramps. Okay, watch the neck bleeding. We've talked about that. That's that's a big deal. Be careful of that. The patient can be hoarse, maybe three four days, probably. I wasn't, but I didn't have a big boggy goiter, so some people are hoarse. Um, watch the swelling. Semifilers typically is the position they put you in. Um, they just, you know, for drainage and everything else. Post-op vital signs, you got to treat them like any other um, post-op patient, you know. Pain meds if they need it. I didn't find it. It was painful at all. It didn't, but I had a very small incision. So, hypothyroidism now. This is decrease under secretion of the thyroid hormones. We had too much, now we have too little. So it's decreasing your metabolic rate. Your TSH can be elevated because it's not a brain problem maybe. You know, TSH is stimulating, stimulating, but the T4 is low. All right, this is a problem. So about 10% of women over 60, they think have subclinical hypothyroidism. This means they have mild failure. Even when they check your levels, they're not so bad. You know, your TSH is normal, maybe a little elevated, your T4 is normal, maybe a little low, maybe a little, and still, you know, there's days you don't feel good, you go to the doctor, by then you feel fine. It waxes and wanes, waxes and wanes. And we can't be drawing blood every day on people. So until it really becomes more significant, you know, they don't address it unless it's really significant. All right, so primary hypothyroidism is caused by the gland. This is destruction of the thyroid or there's a defect in the synthesis. Your thyroid is there, but it's just not making hormone. It's not. The signal comes from the anterior pituitary and it does nothing. So that's primary because that's where the issue is, is in the thyroid gland. Then there's secondary. This is a pituitary disease. You have low TSH. For some reason, your pituitary is not doing its job. It's not giving you TSH. And without TSH, you're not gonna synthesize hormones and you're gonna be hypothyroid. But the fault is the pituitary in secondary, okay? Now, you can even have hypothalamic dys dysfunction, which would make it secondary also. Your TRH has to come from your hypothalamus first. That's thyrotropin releasing hormone. That comes from there first. That tells your pituitary, your anterior pituitary to release TSH. Releasing TSH tells your gland to release thyroid hormones. 
So you can have secondary could be your pituitary gland or your hypothalamus. It's not your thyroid. Primary is your thyroid because that's where the problem is coming from. Okay. All right. Transient causes can be noncompliance. You know, if I all of a sudden got sketchy about giving my med, taking my meds, that's noncompliance. So I'll instantly become hypothyroid because I have nothing else to make up for it. So people that don't take their meds, oh, I forgot this morning, oh, I didn't do this. You can't do that. You need thyroid hormone to live. So you got to take it. All right. Causes of hypothyroidism. Worldwide, lack of iodine. Lack of iodine. In the U.S., it's primarily atrophy of the gland. So we're looking at Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or we're looking at Graves' disease for a long time. And what do we say about hyper? You have it for a long time, eventually your gland's gonna poop out and you become hypothyroid. Whether it's just the glands had it and throws in the towel, or whether the treatment over a long period of time has brought it to this point. But eventually you become hypothyroid. So treatment, of hyperthyroidism, whether it's medication or whether it's surgery or radioactive iodine, is a cause of hypothyroidism. Because think of what it's doing. Surgery is taking the gland out. You can't have thyroid hormone if the gland's gone. Radioactive iodine is killing it. It's so killing the cells, you're gonna end up hypothyroid. Long-term hyperthyroid treatment with um, PTU or with methamazole, whatever it is, high doses of iodine, is eventually gonna knock it out. So there's nothing left. All right, medications, amiodarone. We've talked about this. IODO in amiodarone is all that iodine that's in there. So you may have no other issue, no cancer, no hyperthyroid they've treated that's caused this, but you're on amiodarone because you have this funky arrhythmia and this seems to be what keeps good control. So it has all that iodine in it. That could be enough to cause you to be hypothyroid. Lithium, we know, is a goitrogen. It blocks the, the hormone release. So it could be the lithium's fault. If someone has hypothyroidism in infancy, it's called cretinism. And all infants born in the U.S. are screened for this at birth. All right, so what do you see? Well, long-term deficiency of thyroid hormones. What are you going to see? Slow body processes. This is not hyperthyroid where they're in hyperdrive. They're dragon. They're lethargic. They're tired all the time. Eight hours sleep, they wake up tired. Mental changes, they start forgetting things. They can't remember things. They're, they're just restless and you know, they're just, they're not themselves. Weight gain, again, we're not talking, this is the 600 pound person on TV. We're not talking that you know, hypothyroid is gonna do that to you, but does it slow your metabolism? Yes. So it will cause you to put a few pounds on. The capillary fragility. I mean, these are things that, you know, your, your, um, your body's having trouble. You, you become anemic because you're decreasing your erythropoietin production. So you have low EPO, you have anemia. You, you have anemia and you have risk, risk for angina. You, uh, the um, lack of oxygenated blood flowing around, you can even have an MI. You can have hypertrophy of the heart that can cause an MI for you because what's happening, your BP is all over the place. Everything is slowed down. So to compensate, your body tries to rally. You're still climbing the same flight of stairs. How well can your body compensate for it? So there's a big drain on your other bodily functions. They have a very low exercise tolerance. They're huffing and puffing all the time because everything's such an effort. They're not hungry. The GI is hardly working, so they're nauseous by everything. Occasionally, they'll vomit. They're constipated. They have scaly tongue and scaly. Their skin is terrible. The nails get brittle. Your collagen production is off. Everything. You know, it's your body just doesn't work. They have decreased sweating. What they find is in a hypothyroid state, the sweat cells change and they're just not sweating like they should. So it has systemic effects just like hyper has, only it's the total opposite. So here's a graphic if you're the visual person. This is off a of search engine and uh, it gives you all the hypo, all the cold intolerance, all of it. It's the opposite. 
Okay, so what are the complications here? Well, myxedema coma is a big one. This can be progressive or it's sudden. It's usually long-term hypothyroidism. So somebody who's just not adherent, not taking their meds. And it, the symptoms might come on slowly for them. So they don't take it, they don't take it. Now they're tired, they think they're in school, they're working, they're, I mean, what would you do if you're this tired? You're gonna say, it's all this 202 studying, I work too much, the kids, you know, I'm doing the kids still, keeping the house, all these things. So they don't necessarily see those early signs as something important. It's a medical emergency, myxedema coma. Typically, when we see a sudden onset, you know the people that they talk about in the news that um, one year there was this guy who, I don't know, picked New Year's Eve to take his two young kids, six and eight, on a camping trip in the mountains or something. They got caught in a blizzard and all that. You know, these people that they talk about on the news that are stuck someplace, I'm sure we'll hear them about the nor'easter that's going across the upper part of the country. There's 32 inches in some places. So people are stuck in a car, they're exposed to cold, they're a long time like that. There's a huge metabolic demand on the body. Your, your body's trying to shiver to keep you warm. You don't, just something like that alone can put you in a myxedema coma, never mind if you should be taking Synthroid and don't have it. So exposure to cold is a big one. People that fall through ice into icy cold water and they have to fish them out. People, um, I think of it when I see that show about the, the fishing they do up in Alaska. Every now and again, a guy goes overboard. How long can you last in the Bering Strait exposed to cold water like that? So think of what it does to the body. Can also be a trauma, can also be a trauma. So anything that happens to your thyroid, to your neck, to anything that imposes the stress of a trauma on you can overdo it, drain you, put you in a myxedema coma. So, the symptoms, subnormal temp, they're cold, they're hypotensive, they're hypoventilating, they're just in slug land. I mean, they can't do anything. So what do we do? We're gonna give them IV thyroid hormone replacement and give them ventilatory and vital sign support. Let's talk about that. So, well, let's do diagnostics. So diagnostics, TSH and free T4. Again, we're going back to those. TSH is your thyroid being simulated by your anterior pituitary. It'll tell us right there where the problem might be lying. How's your T4? Is at least that good that if your body needs it, you can make a T3? You know, they're gonna look at that. Okay, TSH is gonna help us, why? If we draw TSH and it's high, then we know the defect is in your thyroid. Why does this make sense? Because if your anterior pituitary is sending out thyroid stimulating hormone, then you should have hormone. If we find you in a hypothyroid state, but your TSH is high, we know the problem's not your anterior pituitary, the problem's your thyroid, right? So it differentiates for us. If you have a low TSH and you have a low, um, your hypothyroid, we're going to say then the defect is either in the pituitary or it's in the hypothalamus. Why is your thyroid stimulating so low? Your body is low in thyroid. It needs it. Where's the stimulation for it to come? So is it a pituitary problem up in your no behind your nose or is it a hypothalamic problem? Is it that the TRH is not getting released to make TSH stimulate, to make thyroid hormone release? So what they'll do in that case is give you thyrotropin hormone. They're gonna stimulate what your hypothalamus should be doing. We'll give you a TRH, and if it's a hypothalamus issue, your TSH will suddenly be high because it would have worked to begin with if your TRH was released. Your TRH wasn't released. I had to give it to you for you to have a response from your anterior pituitary. Then we'll see that once your pituitary was stimulated, now are your thyroid hormones coming up. Then we know the problem was your hypothalamus. If we give you TRH and there's no change in your TSH, you know, what is it telling us? Now it's your anterior pituitary. Because we gave it to you, we gave you TRH, we should see a reaction from your anterior pituitary. 
and is doing nothing. So that's where the problem lies. Hypothalamus is good. It's doing what it's supposed to. Anterior pituitary is not doing what it's supposed to, so your gland can't do what it's supposed to. So it helps doctors figure out where the culprit lies. If they do TPO antibodies, your thyroproxidase antibodies, they're going to say you're probably, it's an autoimmune thing. And then they'll do this, a more detailed autoimmune panel, you know, and do the ANAs and all that stuff and see if this is a more systemic thing than just your thyroid. Could be, you have one autoimmune disease, you can have others. Okay, so euthyroid is the goal. So Synthroid, Levothyroxine, that's going to do it. It's cheap. It's available, it's been around 100 years, it's fine. It's adjusted to the patient response, they'll do labs and they'll get your labs. Cardiac patients, they give you a little less of a dose probably, because the risk is always that in response, your body's gonna rally and they don't want you to have a high heart rate. Uh, it's taken daily, you have to take it the same time every day on an empty stomach. Drives me nuts when I had students in clinical and the nurse would say, oh, you guys are doing the eights. Can you do my seven with it? And they would give us a Synthroid. And the tray is on the overbed table. We have four other meds to give, and she's thrown the Synthroid in. And I would push back and say, you realize this has to be given on an empty stomach. I know, that's what pharmacy said, but you know, it gets so busy, this and that. No, no, <laughs> don't do that. So if it's scheduled seven o'clock, pharmacy puts it at seven for a reason not to make you be annoyed that you have to take report and have a med to give, you know? But it's so that the med can get in and be in on its own before you give it other things. Why are we giving a med we know is gonna be diminished by food and diminished by other drugs? It's doing nothing for your patient. They should not be in our care and have trouble regulating their thyroid when they were doing fine before they came in. That's not right. Okay, so. Low calorie diet, if someone has put some extra poundage on, not hundreds of pounds, they put 10, 15, whatever. Um, mechanical, cardiac, respiratory support as they need it. I've had mixed edema comas who are just that, in a coma, and we're doing all the bodily everything because they can do nothing. Assess the vital signs, the INO, their weights in the bed, the mental status. Patient education is important. If this is a non-compliance issue, if this patient is in because they don't regularly take their med, we can't send them out with that same mentality. You know, they have to realize you wouldn't be in here now if you took your med every day. You can't do this to yourself. You survived this time, you might not again. So this is a matter of life and death. They've got to take it, okay? All right, let me pull up your next slide. Hold on. Get rid of this one. No, I don't want to save. And let me find this one. Here it is. Okay, let me move it over. All right. Slideshow. Yes, manual. Presenter view. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I know it's good to take it on an empty stomach, but like is just waiting an hour to, you know, eat or take other meds, is that enough or? Yeah, that's good, yeah. Okay. Okay, can, let me see. I want to share this, let's see. Can you, you can't see the slide, yeah? Yeah, we can see it. Oh, you can, okay, thank you, whoever that was. You, we, we can't now though, because you took it off. You took it off. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Let me get out of here and fix that. Okay. Come on now. All right. Really? It's going to drive me crazy. <clears throat> and this come in here and this and let's see what happens come on i need my controls where are they okay. uh, here guys hang on 
All right, come on now. All right, it is not going to let me do this. Why is this not? This is only the like zillionth time I've done this. And it works fine every time, but today it's going to grow a wild hair. It's probably telling me, it's the earth telling me, you know, they kind of zonked, they really need a break. <laughs> but. Um, all right, come on. I have no controls. This is the problem. Hold on one second. We're getting there. This should do it. Let's hope. Okay, does that make sense? Can you see it? Anybody? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. All right. You were all hoping that it was going to be the demise of it, huh? <laughs> okay, so now we're going to talk about your parathyroids, and we'll continue this tomorrow. We'll have more to talk about tomorrow as well. Uh, adrenals and pancreas. Okay, so here's your parathyroids. This is your anatomy review. This is the back of your thyroid gland. Looks kind of snake-like, actually. Those are all your thyroid cells. Here are these four little glands that are embedded in the back, and they're very, very vascular also. For tiny little glands, they bleed like you have no idea. They're very, very vascular. So they secrete parathyroid hormone by a feedback mechanism. So they regulate your calcium that way. Um, they affect bone absorption. They inhibit formation. They, if you need calcium, um, they have a role in your absorption of calcium on the renal level. You know how you need active vitamin D from your kidney to absorb calcium. You had that with um, kidney diseases in 152. Um, the renal conversion of vitamin D to active form. So all of that plays a part with your parathyroid. So we don't think much about parathyroid glands. You don't even think you have them or what they do, but uh, you know, it's, they have a big role. Okay, so hyperparathyroidism. What are we talking about? Over secretion of calcium. You know, it's about 1% of the population in the US, so you don't see it a lot but there's three different kinds we talk about and they're all pretty distinct. Okay, primary, this is gonna be involving the gland itself, right? But it causes disorders of calcium and phosphate in bones. Calcium and phosphate go together, but in a disease state, they go opposite. So when there's something wrong and you have low calcium, you'll have high phosphate. If you have high phosphate, low calcium, low calcium, high. If you have low calcium, you have high phosphate. If you have uh, low phosphate, you'll have high calcium. They work opposite in disease states. Okay, what can cause it? A tumor, an adenoma. We're always talking about glandular tissue, adenomas. So even these four little bead-like things can have an adenoma grow off of them. And it's not involving your thyroid, it's involving your parathyroid. It can be that you've had radiation to the head or the neck. You've had cancer of the jaw, it's in the jawbone. You've had, um, you know, years ago, if you look at your demographic, if it's a really older person, 80s, 90s, they used to get irradiated in their skin for acne years and years ago, probably when they were in their teens. And no one thought of protecting your thyroid with a lead shield, none of that back then. So if they've had a history of radiation for acne, uh, that could be coming back to get them now. So long-term lithium treatment. Here's our poor psych patients again, who lithium might be the one drug keeping them stable. And again, it's problematic. Long-term lithium does it. More women than men. So this has a hormonal influence, a female hormone influence. We don't know what. And it's, it's 25 out of 100,000 people on average, but you, you don't really, you don't see that much. Even when I worked where they did a lot of endocrine cases in Boston, we didn't see a lot of um, hyperparathyroidism. Okay, so secondary. This is compensatory. This is a compensatory response to anything that causes hypocalcemia. Low calcium is the main stimulus for parathyroid hormone. You have low calcium, parathyroid hormone is going to act up and say, the body needs calcium, I'll take it out of the bone. I'll get it for you right now. So that's the main stimulus. And they'll bring it to the blood so the body has it. 
So this you see, you learned about in 152, you see this with um, chronic renal failure patients, a perfect example. They have vitamin D deficiency because they don't have active vitamin D because they don't have a healthy kidney. And that's where we get active vitamin D from is your kidney. So they have vitamin D deficiencies. They have malabsorption because they're diet limited and their disease process. They have dietary issues. They have malabsorption. They have chronic kidney disease. And with low calcium, because they can't absorb it without vitamin D, they have high phosphate. So if you took care of any of those patients going off to dialysis, they give them phosphate binders with their meals so that they're binding the phosphate. If we can bring the phosphate down, we're trying to force the calcium up. That's what they're doing. So tertiary is also seen in a renal uh, group. These are people who've had long-term dialysis, long-term, and the body was so accustomed to having low levels of calcium that now they've gotten a transplant. They have a healthy kidney and everything is good. They probably have normal parathyroid hormones and still it's inactive. It's active, active, it's in active mode. It's just dumping, dumping because the body is so accustomed to constantly needing it that the shutoff switch, the feedback loop is gone, the shutoff doesn't happen. And so their secretion of parathyroid hormone, even when the calcium's good, even when the levels are normal. So it's another pathology that develops that this poor person who thought their renal failure days were behind them now has this new kidney that's working great and they have this other issue that they probably never heard about. You know, So it's hard for people. All right, what do you see? Some people are asymptomatic. When we used to have them up on the transplant floor at Maine, they were not symptomatic at all for this. They can be. But what are the signs at first? You know, a little muscle weakness or a loss of appetite or GI-wise they're constipated or if that was you, you would attribute it to something else. You're not thinking it's something this unusual. Emotional disorders or their attention span isn't what it was or, you know, that's not something that people are going to notice necessarily about themselves. So now when the calcium is coming from the bone, that's a different thing. It might be causing them um, fractures. They might fall and the doctor will be saying, why are you breaking bones so easily? Last week it was a wrist, now it's your ankle. What's happening here? And if they look into your bone density, they'll see where is your calcium going? So that may be an indicator. If you're suddenly having kidney stones and you never had them all your life, they're wondering where is this all this calcium coming from? So it may take them back to investigate that further. Serious effects of this can be renal failure. It can be pancreatitis, which is not good. Someone has pancreatitis, not only is it serious, but it can become chronic. Once you've had one case, you can have it again in just a chronic condition. Cardiac arrhythmias, because we're messing with calcium, that's important to stay stable, and fractures. People can have lots of them. So not a good thing. All right, so diagnostics. Well, parathyroid hormone levels are elevated. Calcium is up over 10, which means phosphorus will be down. Um, DEXA scans, they'll do dual energy x-ray absorption. So they're gonna look to see the bone density. They're gonna go looking for tumors. So we're back to our CT and our MRI. And the treatment is gonna depend on how symptomatic you are and really what it's doing to your body, you know? All right, so collaborative care, we can do surgery. They can go in if you have primary or secondary disease. They can go in your hypercalcemic, your hypercalciuric. You have, you know, decreased bone density. They have to do something, so they can go in and take your glands out. Sometimes they'll take two and leave two and see if that helps you. On renal floors, what you see a lot of is auto transplantation. So they know you're in this state, and they'll go in and take out two, and the other two they'll put in your arm in your forearm here and transplant them there. Now it's outside the feedback loop, but you have some source of calcium to help your body function. Um, they can put it in your sternocleidomastoid muscle in your back here. It's a big muscle. It's a good nutritive environment for them to transplant your parathyroid glands, and that can work. If that continuous infusion that those transplanted glands provide for you 
is not enough or if they fail, which they can, because you're putting these little glands with all their vasculature into a muscle or into your forearm and hope it takes. If it doesn't work, you don't have calcium intake. So now you're taking continuous calcium supplements your whole life. And that's hard for people. They give you calcium carbonate. It's like taking Tums all the time, but it's not the same as having endogenous calcium for sure. All right, so interprofessionally, well, non-surgical therapy for asymptomatic patients, what do we do for people all the time? If somebody has osteoporosis, they use bisphosphonates, right? You've heard of those. You've seen the commercials for Fosamax and Aredia and all those drugs. Now, these work for people with normal kidney function who have low phosphate and severe hypercalcemia they're gonna go more with sodium chloride, IVs, all that, give you diuretics, make sure you pee. But the bisphosphonates are, you know, you have osteoblasts that build bone, you have osteoclasts that break it down. Bisphosphonates go in and they interrupt that process and they inhibit the osteoclasts from resorption. It slows the whole process down and helps your bone maintain its density. Now, there's side effects to it. It can cause you kidney problems. When you see those commercials on TV, it says, you know, you must get up and walk how much after it. You must do this and you must have your kidney function checked and all these things. They're not without its issues, but it does interfere with the breakdown resorption process and in, in, it tries to increase your bone density. So we can go with that. We can try and restore that and give them that. The oral phosphates will always um, if we can regulate the phosphate, we can regulate the calcium. And for the severe hypercalcemia, if they're going to give you sodium chloride IVs, then they give you loop diuretics so that you're sure you're peeing it out and um, you're not depositing it places that you're having kidney stones. We can also do calcium emetics, like Cinecalcid, it's called Cinespar. I don't know if you've had to give it to people, but it increases the sensitivity of your calcium receptor gland. So it's, it's not reacting so much and um, affecting your calcium. It's used for primary and secondary, chronic renal failure, parathyroid cancers. You'll see it's pretty standard treatment if you get a patient like this. All right, so why don't we stop for today and we'll pick up here tomorrow. I'll see you in the morning for this and for adrenal and pancreas, okay? Have a good rest of the day. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.